Um, let me start saying that we are going to specify concurrent programs through types. Our idea is that we are going to use type theory because type theory is already compositional, and we are interested in obtaining compositionality of proofs. So instead of having this whole triple this way, like um, precondition, program, and postcondition, we will see the precondition and postcondition as part of the type of our program. Since we are doing concurrency, we need, or let's say more, the type will need to list also the atomic effects on the data extractor. So we need to extend our type with a state transition systems that we will call resources. Um, let me show in a very simple example one resource. This is a spin log, and I will show you two programs, one for locking and one for unlocking. The locking program is going to is going to try to to put the the lock into true. R is a reference to the lock itself. When it is true, it's lock, and when it's false, it's unlock. So it's going to loop there. It's going to try to do this cast, this compare and swap, and eventually, I mean, it will loop there. It will try to to write the um, the lock into true. So we will have some. ID transitions in the resource, and eventually we will be able to um, log to change the R into true, and then we will perform like the log transition there. Um, for unlocking, is the the program is a little bit easier. We will just try to write false into the um, into the log. The thing is that uh, in this specification, uh, I can call unlocking even if I didn't lock before. Um, so um, the idea is that we will have uh, the lock will have this type, some precondition, postcondition, and we will say it's in the resource, a spin. And the same thing with, with unlock. OK, this is because uh, we want to have like a very general specification for spin locks. Our idea is that we are going to derive from spin locks other more complex logs. In order to let me show you the, um, the specification for for locking and unlocking, and for that we are going to use histories that we will represent with a tau. A history is going to be just a timestamp that will give us like atomic operation, either lock or unlock. So this could be like a very simple uh, specification for lock. Let's think at the beginning we don't have anything in our history. So after performing log, what we'll have is a new timestamp that will lead to a log, to a locking. But I say that this t, this timestamp should be new. So we'll need to add something more. We will add this tau o that will mean the history for the other threads that are in our environment. And then we can say that t is new because um, the timestamp is greater than the rest of the timestamps. For unlocking, we could try to do the, exactly the same idea. I mean, we start with no history, so we say, OK, let's put one new timestamp with unlock, and we perform the same thing. But as I said before, this could fail. I mean, another thread could uh, unlock before that we try to, un to unlock. So in this case, the specification should be a little bit more complex. We have to add the other case, the case when we cannot unlock. So we leave our history um, empty, and we say that another thread was the one that performed unlocking. So this very simple example already shows that the specifying is not trivial. I mean, we have to take into account many things when we are specifying concurrent programs. So what we do in, in our paper, the idea is that we are going to, to use morphemes in order to derive other kinds of logs or other kinds of programs from, from some other ones. The idea is, for example, here, we have this log and unlock in a spin. And since we are thinking in our programs that they have some type, we will need something to change the types. And this will be our morphemes. So for example, uh, with this spin log, very 
a simple spring lock, maybe we want to implement an exclusive locking where we have mutual exclusion. Or maybe from that very same spring lock, we want to implement a non-exclusive um, lock like readers, writers, where we have uh, some field that many users can read, but only one can write, and then we have the mutual exclusion in that part. And apart from that, what we want is not to make again the whole specification part. We want that we want that the specification that we already had can be transformed to the specification for the the evasions of the logs or whatever thing we have. So in the remainder of the talk, I'm going to show you precisely what are these morphemes. I'm going to show you a typing rule for morphemes and the use why we need their simulations and an example. So let me start with the morphemes. The idea is that morphemes are going to be just functions between resources. So since resources are straight transition systems, we will need a, a resource, I mean, morphemes will have two a, parts. One that will be in charge of changing the states is this F sigma, and one that will be in charge of changing the transitions, the F a, M delta. The idea is that these morphemes will also change the program itself, and that will help us to keep the usability of proofs. So let's think, I mean, we have a program E in some resource B. And we want to know which is going to be the, the morph of that program. What is going to be this FE? So as I say, the morphing has two components. We will need to say for its uh, state in W, what is going to be the state in V. And I will show you after that why it is in this order. And for every transition in V, we will need to say which is going to be the transition in W. So imagine um, we want to we have a program in E, and we can think of it as some kind of um, it, I mean uh, some sequence of transitions in the resource, and we want to compute the morph program the F I F E sorry. So we start with a, a state in W. The morphings will give us a state in V. There we know that we have to perform the transition T B. And the morphemes will give us which is the transition in W that we will need to perform. And this process is iterative. I mean, we will continue with the next transition in B, and after we will get with that a transition in W, and so on and so on, until we finish with that program. So from a program in E, we will obtain a program in, well, for a program in in the resource V, we will obtain a program in the resource W like this way, with this FE. But of course, um, I said before that the type of the program is also the precondition and postcondition. So we will need also to change the, con the precondition and postcondition accordingly. And this is what I'm going to show you now. This is where the typing rule appears. Um, the idea is that we are going to fill the blanks in that rule. We will need to we will need a precondition there that will ensure that the program the most program program won't go wrong. I mean, and I say this because let me show how uh, if we morph a program it could get stuck. So this is the same um, diagram as before. And the idea is that we start with a with a, um, a state in W, and we will compute these pink lines. And we need these pink lines in order to obtain which is the transition in W that we will compute. After that, I said that this is an iterative process, and that we will continue doing this process with all the transitions in the, in V. The thing is that in general, this. Um, this arrow may not exist. I mean, there is no guarantee in general that this diagram can be completed. So in order to, to ensure that, what we need is to restrict SW. We will need to restrict the states in W. And we will do that with a predicate, with a simulation, 
But you can think of like some kind of loop invariant, but but morphemes. I mean, it's kind of the morphemes invariant. We're going to impose that this predicate is preserved along the diagram. And with this, what we indeed obtain is that uh, this diagram commutes. That means that if you follow the pink lines and the black lines, you will reach the very same um, element. And this will ensure that we can, um, that the most program will work. OK, this is what I said. Um, the idea, I mean, before presenting the, the rule, I have to give you this another definition of how we morph a set of states. Imagine we have a set of states R in V, and we want to transform it into another set of states in W, FR. This is the definition, and the idea is quite simple. We say that a, an state is going to be in, in this FR if and only if there exists another state in V, well, in R, in this case, such that is the image with respect to the morphism. Okay, with, with this, we can we have all the ingredients in order to get the inference rule for the morphemes. So, uh, what we already know, as I said before, is that that this uh, simulation acts as an invariant. So we know that in W, uh, the states are going to satisfy the invariant. So in our rule, we will need to add the invariant. We will say that we are only going to consider it stays that satisfies the invariant, and we know something more. For example, from SW, we know that there exists a transition that will lead us to a, a state in V. Since we are interested in running the program E in V, we, can, uh, we will only consider those states there that satisfy the precondition, P. And this is precisely the definition I gave you before. This is like the morphine, morphemes of the um, precondition. Similarly, we can do the same with the postcondition. And this will lead us to the inference rule, where what we have is that we simply are considering the, the invariant, the simulation, and the transformation of the Precondition and the transformation of the postcondition. Let me show this by means of an example. Um, as I said at the beginning, we are interested in attaching behaviors to spring logs. So um, I don't have time to explain you one uh, something more interesting, but let let us consider this uh, extension of spring logs. This is just a very simple resource. What, what we want is just to add one every time that we make a login. Um, this counter resource on the right is a very simple one. It has only two transitions, one the identity transition, and the other is a transition that will increment in one some counter. Um, that kappa on the right is the only field that the, the counter resource has. And it's just simply a, an integer number that says which is the, the value of the counter. So I'm going to call this C spin in the next uh, slides, which is going to be the definition of the, of the morphemes. Um, this C spin is going to have the states in C spin are going to be pairs. One component is going to talk about the counter, and the other is going to talk about the, the spin. So we have um, some histories and some number. The morphing on, on the states is just going to be the, the first projection. It's going to take only the, the histories. Um, for the transitions, for example, the locking transition in a spin is going to be morphed to this uh, bow time between the locking transition in a spin and the incremental transition by one. The bow time, just without entering any details, what it does is that those two transitions will be fired together. For example, a lock transition will be just mapped to a locking and identity transition. 
because we are not going to change the counter if we unlock. So the idea, I mean, the expected uh, specification, we already know. I mean, the idea is that if we are going to lock, if we start in our counter with n, we are going to reach n plus 1. But let me show how we can derive that specification using our rule, our inference rule. In order to do that, we need to recall the specification of log. Remember, if we start with the empty, the empty history, we will just add one login event, and we will say that the timestamp is new. Actually, for this example, we can stick with this very, to this even simpler uh, specification. For other cases, if we want to put the, the spin log with another resource, we will need probably the other part. But for this example, we can just stay with this. We need our simulation. We need our invariant. And the invariant is going to be something very easy. It's always going to be the counter, what is sitting in the counter, and we are going to add one every time that we, lock, that we are locking. So we are counting the number of logs that we, are in, that we have in the history, and we're adding that to the counter. Um, what we have to do is simply to to fill the, um, the formula. And what we get is what we expected. The idea is that at the beginning, the counter is n. We don't have nothing in our history. And after performing the log, we will add one to the counter, and we will add a log, in, a log event in our history. Um, in the paper, there is more things. Uh, in particular, here I have to only show cases of more things when we are essentially extending the, the resource. But for example, um, for installing a resource into a private state, we have also a morphemes. This is, the idea is that maybe we want to execute something without any interference, and this is what is called quiescence. For example, we have, we have an example where we have a stack, and what we do is just put it into a private heap where it can be um, can be executed without any kind of interference. For this, we had to extend the definition of morphemes to what we call families of morphemes. Details are on the paper. Also, we have the notion of sub-resource. The idea is that in some cases, we will need to restrict the state space of the resource. The, um, the notation could be like that. I mean, the idea is that we have the resource and we just mod out by some kind of invariant, some kind of property that we want to ensure to all the, the state space in the morphemes, in the resource, sorry. Um, this example shows how, how morphemes compose. Because, the, for example, I was saying at the beginning that we were morphing, for example, uh, the spin log to an exclu exclusive locking, an exclu exclusive locking, and we do that, but we need to restrict a little bit the state space because there were some some states in a spin that they were not matching with the state in this other resource called exclusive. Again, the details are on the paper. So just to wrap up, the the takeaway is that we have defined morphemes. Um, basically to, to adapt concurrent programs to larger contexts, to different contexts. This is an idea that is essentially inspired by function spaces in type theory. For the inference rule, we will need some kind of, we need a, we needed some invariant, and that's what we call simulations. We have applied this to some examples that are implemented in COG and are available in the web page. And this led us to a compact formulation of separation logic where we have, on top of COG, nine additional rules. So thank you very much, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Ilya, can you come up forward? <laughs> Uh, 
on the religion of a uh, simulation and the proofs done also by means of simulation in uh, certified abstraction layers in the deep spec project okay well um actually i have I have even here the definition of simulation, but you will probably don't see. Okay, the idea, <laughs> uh, I have shown only one part of the definition of simulation, that is that it makes that di diagram commute. But there is another part that it speaks, I mean, I didn't give much detail. As you know, there we have this uh, subjectivity way of seeing things, like my view and the other's view. And we have another condition, the second condition over there, that is the one that actually, I mean, is complete. I mean, is useful and is totally needed in order to have that the inference rule is um, is stable. So, sorry, <laughs> maybe I didn't answer to your question, right? Well, okay. We are doing separation logic, whereas the deep deep specification layers do not, because so far I don't see too much difference okay. between the, your definition and what they have there. Okay, probably, probably. I mean, this is, I mean, um, I don't know precisely how to answer that. Sorry. All right. So, uh, actually, my question is not the uh, same as Elliot. Uh, so, I was just curious. Uh, I mean, it's very good work. Then I, I'm curious, all your examples starts with the log. Yes. Going to add something to the log. Do you have any example that... Uh, you know, um, does not start with the log. I mean, I'm mean, intrigued. Why always start with the log? And uh, we uh, started with a log. Okay, sorry, <laughs> because that was one of the easiest way that we could present in the paper and sure. also in our work. We have also the example for quiescence, which is completely different. Okay. And but no, I mean, so far we have applied this also to other examples. But it's true that the majority of our examples, at least in the paper, are with locking. I see. You have an additional example. It's in the paper. Yes. Or for example, the quiescence one is okay. nothing to do with the locks. All right. Uh, let's thank Ignacio again. Uh, no.